My lords, and ladies and gentlemen, the Queen and I have listened with special interest to the account which Lord Rayleigh has given some aspects of the work of the Imperial College since its foundation. His position as a former professor and as chairman of the governing body qualify him to speak of this subject. And we have heard something of the way in which the college has carried out the intentions of those who shaped it. I speak now as its visitor. And as its visitor, I recall the interest taken by my family not only in the Imperial College since its foundation in the reign of King Edward VII, but in its three constituent colleges ever since the first beginnings which we celebrate this evening. Now, the Royal College of Chemistry, at its inception in 1845, had as its president my great-grandfather, the Prince Consul. <laughs> he showed the same interest for the well-being of Della Bache's School of Mines, and as President of the Royal Commissioners for the Exhibition in 1851, he gained for science and the arts that great site on which, with other institutions, the Imperial College now stands. It is, I think, now generally accepted that the idea of the great international exhibition of 1851 was started by the Prince Consort himself and that he took a large share in carrying it out. At the time, it had to face serious opposition in the press. And while the Royal Commission took formal responsibility, the industrialists hung back and did not give the necessary support. <coughs> the Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, had anxious consultations with his colleagues. And as a result, it was arranged the Dr. Lyon Playfair would become a special commissioner. Eventually, the exhibition was a financial success that left a large surplus in the hands of the commissioners on which they spent but mainly at the instance of the Prince Concert and Dr. Playfair in purchasing the South Kensington site. The Lion Playfair, as the Queen asked me to remind you, bore the name of her family with which he was connected through his mother. And indeed, his school days had been largely spent in the manse in the village of Glam. <laughs> As Lord Rayleigh 
has told us he heads the list of your professors of chemistry having held that having held that position in the government school of mines prior to its incorporation with the Royal College of Chemistry. But while it is interesting thus to recall of the past, my own concern as your visitor is with the Imperial College of today. And as your visitor, I take pleasure in the contributions it has made to total victory. <laughs> Lord Rayleigh has touched on some of them in the field of applied entomology and preventive medicine. And I am well aware that he could, at time allowed, have pointed a to equally impressive victories won by our other departments in other fields. <clears throat> I know that the success of our D-Day invasion was in great part due to engineers trained in your city. <laughs> engineers who were trained in your city and Gills College. <laughs> and I also know that Imperial College has contributed to victory not only by research but by training of men who go from it to all parts of the empire. The achievements of British science and technology during these last years of total war have been outstanding. With relatively limited resources and these are strained to the uttermost, we may nevertheless claim to have outmatched our enemies in every vital respect. <laughs> what has been accomplished not only fills our hearts with justifiable pride, but should be a great source of encouragement to the whole nation in facing the hard tasks that now lie immediately ahead. Of the same vigor, ingenuity, and skill that have brought us to victory must be engaged in ever increasing measure in the work of reconstruction. At the same time, our ardor must be tinged with apprehension when we reflect upon the potency of the instrument which new developments in the realm of science are placing at the disposal of the human race. The employment of 
of atomic energy for the first time under the stress of war may well mark the beginning of a new era of scientific discovery of the results that may follow in the course of time no one can speak with confidence but the possibilities seem limitless a vast material benefit to all mankind on the one hand or on the other hand of destruction on a scale hitherto undreamt of. We must all pray that wisdom may be vouchsafed to the statesmen of the world so that means may be found ere it is too late of ensuring that the new knowledge recently gained is used solely for the promotion of peace and the raising of standards of life in all parts of the world. For you students who have assembled, a men and women who soon will be going out from the Imperial College to your work in the world, have not only an opportunity, but also a responsibility far greater than men of science have known before. And to you, I say, regard your knowledge and your skill, always in the light of a trust for the benefit of humanity, and thereby ensure so far as in you lies, that science may never be put to uses which offend the higher conscience of mankind. <laughs>